We've just had our scripture reading, Acts 2, verses 1 to 4. It was an extraordinary time. The gift of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost made ordinary men and women do extraordinary things, right? Powerful preaching of the gospel took place. A great many people did not like the preaching of Peter. You know why? He was an inexperienced preacher. And uh, a lot of people today wouldn't like it either. <laughs> but lives were changed that day. Shame, sobs, tears overspread the assembly as Peter preached. Hard-headed businessmen, fanatical religionists, prejudiced people all had their hearts softened that day. They were convicted as the Holy Spirit spoke to their hearts. And finally, the words came from troubled hearts. What must we do? Would that that could take place all over this valley. What do you think? What do you say? What shall we do? Peter had an answer. It's Acts 2, verse 38. Let's look at it. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Acts 2, verse 38. <clears throat> when you have it, say amen. amen. Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you. How many of you? Every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Never before had 3,000 people listened to the unwelcome message of an unskilled preacher. Peter was definitely not an orator. He said a lot of, thought a lot of foolish things, you know, as you look back in the Gospels and his conversations with people and with Jesus. Burn the city down. Things like that. Uh, but Peter had been with Jesus for three and a half years. He'd been to the cross. And now the Holy Spirit worked through him. Power to proclaim the gospel. I don't think we need to be overly um, conscious about our gifts. Sometimes I think we've overemphasized that trying to search out what gift you have. I think it's important to recognize those things, but more so asking for the Holy Spirit to gift us according to our, our, our needs, the circumstances that he puts us in. That's where we really need to pray earnestly. God, not, not does, God does not call the qualified, but he qualifies those whom he calls. If you pray for the gift of, the, of service and mission, God will put you in the place where you can develop a talent that can be used by God, a gift, a gift that comes from the Holy Spirit. Peter had two things going for him. He had uh, truth to proclaim. We have truth to proclaim, right? How do we know it's truth? It comes from the word, right? It's the real authority that we have, is the word. He had truth to proclaim, that's important. And he had the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, the power of the Holy Spirit and the word go together. Uh, you really can't have one without the other and have success. The Holy Spirit uses us, not the other way around. He's in charge of the gifts and he will combine these gifts with our natural talents as the need arises. So what was Peter's message? Again and again, Peter's message and the, the it's just, you no, know, it's interesting to read the sermons in the, in, the, uh, in the book of Acts. It's just interesting to read them. Death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. That was their focus. That was his focus that day. You know, that was the present truth in the first century, right? And I'm going to say, I think it's present truth now too. We need it more now than they did in the first century. But that's what the preachers of the first, of the first century 
spoke again and again with the power of the Holy Spirit, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, and confirmed it with baptisms. I'd like to uh, invite you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter, this is one of the best definitions of the gospel that, uh, that I think I found in the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4. It says, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preach to you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preach to you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and he rose the third day according to the scriptures. That is the Christian gospel. And uh, Paul uh, preached it with, uh, with power. Paul declares this to be the gospel. He also, also in Acts chapter 1, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 1, Paul talking again, and again, verses 1 to 4. Notice uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Another definition of our message for the world. Because the first angel says that we are to take the everlasting gospel. Why everlasting? It began way back in the, in the Garden of Eden, didn't it? That one would come. Even God himself would come to this world and do what he did. I can't imagine this. Here it says, verse 1 of chapter 1 of Romans. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the what? Gospel of God, which he promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. All those elements are in that, aren't they? The gospel. Paul knew how to teach the gospel with great power. It's interesting to read the, the Pentecostal sermon of Peter and, and other first century uh, uh, sermons in the book of Acts. <clears throat> They're all centered in Jesus Christ. That passage we just read said that Jesus is the gospel. It doesn't need anything added to it or taken away from it, right? They are all centered on Jesus Christ. The first century church had few of the benefits that we have, such as radio, television, internet. They had few of those. They didn't have any of those in the first century. Yet in the first century, the gospel went to every creature under heaven. And that was written probably prior to 64 AD. Every creature under heaven, the whole then known world. There were, there were uh, co-workers of the disciples, went clear over into India and up, up into Europe. And, you know, eventually the gospel got clear over into the Orient. We have evidence for that. North Africa. Wow. First century. And we're in deep trouble in our outreach if we s substitute human ideas for outreach for Holy Spirit power. It's absolutely essential for us to pray for the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that God is more willing to give his Holy Spirit, give the Holy Spirit to us than a good father, good gifts to his children. If we don't receive, it's because we do not what? We do not ask. Okay. We're living on the verge of great gospel outreach, great gospel proclamation. We're living right on the verge of that. And uh, we call it the loud cry. And uh, the loud cry has this in, its, in it, come out of her, my people. Where do we think the largest amount of God's people are right now? They're all through the Christian bodies, aren't they? 
Come out of her, whose people? My people, God says. What is the light that covers the earth? In Revelation 18, 1 to 4, it says that the glory of God fills the whole earth as the message of the gospel is proclaimed to the world. What is the glory that fills the whole world? It's a revelation of God's character. What is God really like? It all comes down to who is Jesus and what was he like? He came here on a mission that uh, none of us can really comprehend. I can't comprehend it. I heard Craig say this morning, I don't know how our prayers reach to heaven. Do you know how? I can't explain that. It's the speed of thought, right? God knows how to do those things. He knows how to reach the hearts of people. And one of these days very soon, that call is going to go forth to the world, come out of her, my people. Whatever they're, they're involved in, they're going to come out in great, great numbers. <clears throat> the only difference between our outreach here in the 21st century and the outreach in the first century is that we're proclaiming the gospel in the framework of the judgment hour. When we talk about the judgment hour, we're talking about something that's very urgent, right? Judgment is urgent. It's urgent that we become in, come into a, a uh, I'm not, I don't want to use the word habit, that we come into a, uh, a, a, a way of life that, that we are reaching other people with the gospel. Of course, the gospel puts the character of God on full display. It's about God putting everything on the line for our salvation. All heaven was poured out in one gift. He sent his only son. We should ask for the fire to fall so that we can tell what God has done for us through his son, Jesus Christ. Pray for the fire to fall. I know at uh, Yosemite, I used to go there very early on, and a call would go across the valley, let the fire fall. And what happened? The ashes and the coals from that fire that they had at the top of El Capitan would go over the cliff. Let the fire fall. And I think that's uh, good for us to think about. Let the fire fall. I'd like to read a passage from Revelation 8, verse 4. Now, you may have not used this ver heard this verse used this way before. I would urge you to study it carefully in the framework that's given here. But chapter 8 of Revelation, verse 4. <clears throat> Verse 4 says, And the smoke of the incense, <clears throat> which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angels' hands. Now this is a sanctuary scene. A sanctuary scene just preceding the trumpets. Then it says, And the angel took the censer and filled it with what? Fire. It doesn't say coals here. It says Fire. What does fire represent? <laughs> and the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth, and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. I'll tell you, when the loud cry goes forth, it'll, be, it'll look just like that. It'll have tremendous opposition. It will seem like lightning. And uh, as the latter rain falls upon those who are giving the final warning message, it'll be a time of your life to be alive. I don't know how many of you have been to a rodeo. I came to up from Idaho. They have a lot of rodeos up there. This is going to be a rodeo. It's going to be a ride like you never saw before. And every one of us are going to be involved. When the fire falls, it will be Pentecost again. The final message to the world will be a manifestation of a spirit's power and given by every true believer in their lives 
and in their voices. Their voices are important. Sometimes uh, we've said, well, live it before the people. And if you have to, say a few words, but there are going to be a lot of words said in the end time. And the gospel is going to be proclaimed. Truth, Bible truth, will come from, from every true believer. Seventh-day Adventists have been, been, been predicting the second coming of Christ for many, many years now. But Jesus hasn't come. Notice carefully the wording of Matthew 24, verse 14. Matthew 24, verse 14. <clears throat> I think this is a, a tremendous promise to all of us, and we need to probably take it to heart. Matthew 24, 14, it says, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Who are the preachers here? Is it the pastor in the pulpit? No. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. When does the end come? When the gospel is proclaimed. <laughs> okay. Maybe, just maybe, the gospel hasn't been proclaimed yet. What do you think about that? The fact that we're still here is evidence that at least... <clears throat> At this point, the gospel has yet, hasn't yet, has yet to be preached in all the world. Great power of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> as a witness to all the nations. <clears throat> I've been having trouble with my voice the greater part of this last week, so I still am. I hope you can put up with my scratchy voice. The miracle of Pentecost was that the proclamation of truth didn't stop with Peter. In fact, I think that day, all the disciples <clears throat> were out there proclaiming the gospel, a meaningful word to those people who couldn't understand their language. And uh, that's, what the gift of, that's what the gift of tongues was for, right? It was a communication tool for people who needed to hear the gospel in their own tongue, in their own tongue. But the people were also on fire. Let's notice uh, from Acts chapter 2. The people also were on fire. Acts chapter 2, 41 and 42. Acts chapter 2, 41 and 42. Do we have it? <clears throat> Then they that gladly received the word were baptized. And the same day they were added to them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the, apostle, in the apostles' doctrine or teaching and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And 46 and 47, and they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. <clears throat> it certainly implied that <clears throat> these converts were so <clears throat> excited that they were witnesses to people all around Jerusalem and in and out of the temple. <clears throat> And people were born into God's kingdom to minister. A church that is on fire with the Holy Spirit, with Holy Spirit witnessing through them, is a vital ministry. It's not a mission field. That church is not a mission field. It has a mission. I, there's a little sign out here. I don't know who put that sign up. But as we leave here, it says, you are now entering your what? Your mission field. We're all missionaries. We're living in a post-Christian world. <clears throat> and we have a message for the people around us. Nothing can separate for the substitute for this. Revelation 1, verses 6 and 7. Revelation 1, verse 6 and 7. I've looked at this verse with awe. <clears throat> And has made us, hey, that might help. Thank you. 
Bear with me for a second. Thank you, Wayne. Verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> and has made us kings and priests to God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye will see him. He has made us what? Kings and priests. Take another swallow of water here. Priests are ministers, right? Is that what priests do? They minister to people. <clears throat> they teach. Uh, Matthew 28, verse 19 talks about that. Matthew 28, verse 19. By the way, we're, ministering, we're missing Lamont here this morning. Did you notice that? <clears throat> he came down with a bug. Let's pray for Lamont. Matthew 28, verse 19. It says, <clears throat> Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> teach here. <clears throat> the translation teach doesn't come through very well in the English translation. It, the idea here is to disciple people. Teach them? Yes, teach them. But disciple them. And then baptize them. To disciple them is to make what? More disciples. That's how the, that's how the message spreads. <clears throat> the gospel to all the world in the final generation will be, be given by a great teaching body who have been discipled to witness with the authority of kings. Witness with the authority of kings, right? Kings and priests. And the grace of priests, a nation of kings and priests. To witness with the authority of kings and the grace of priests. I think that's something to get excited about. And then, finally, the reward of all of this, behold, he comes with clouds and every eye will see him. That's the goal. A miracle of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost was manifest in the gift of tongues. People were brought to conversion. Notice Acts chapter 2, verses 6 and 11. Acts chapter 2, verses 6 and 11. I think we're going to see a genuine gift of tongues before it's all over with. Many of us will be displaced and we'll be with people that we don't, don't understand us. But notice what it says here in verse 6. Acts chapter 2, verse 6. It says, <clears throat> Now when, it, when this was noised about, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own what? Amen. Language. And verse 11. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. That is the true gift of tongues. And it's a gift of the Spirit, just like teaching is a gift, or some of the other gifts that we, that we talk about. That, by the way, is the true gift of tongues. You know, the Corinthian church misused that gift. We could read about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Like they misused a lot of things in, the first, in that first century church. They were taking each other to court. 
They were doing immoral things. They were living scandalous lives, some of them. Carnal Christians, he called them. You're carnal Christians. Can't do that and be working with the Holy Spirit. And so that's, that's what it was like in that first, cent in that first century church. So <clears throat> the final outpouring of power by God's final generation will be manifest with no less power than it began in the first century. No less power in the end time. I'm glad for that, aren't you? Spirit baptism was so important in the first century that when Peter preached to the Samaritans, many were baptized with water. Peter and John were sent to meet them. You know, <laughs> Philip was preaching there and he was baptizing people with water. And then it says that Peter and John were sent over there to where, where Philip was preaching. Soon after their arrival, they laid hands on these new Samaritan converts and prayed for them to receive the baptism of the Spirit. You can read about that in Acts chapter 8, 12 to 17. We'll leave that out of our discussion this morning. But why would they all be baptized with the Spirit? Why was that important? They're bapt we're, we are born into God's kingdom, born again into his kingdom for the purpose of witnessing. That's why we're here. We have all kinds of different ways to do that, right? Some of us go knocking on doors. Some of us have Bible studies. Some of us just smile. <laughs> I like to go out with Craig. You know what he does? He goes up to everybody he, he sees, and he's got four or five little books in his hand. And he says, you know, uh, which one of these would, would appeal to you? He's never met him before. <laughs> he went to a fire station the other day and did that. <laughs> these guys are standing around, you know, it's between fires, and they don't have much to do right at that moment. And he said, takes about five little books with him, little, little books like we have out here. We can all do that, can't we? Does anything here interest you? Yeah, they'll usually pick out one. <laughs> You're not asking them to take something. You're just saying, would something like this interest you? And they'll take something. It's implied, isn't it? <clears throat> so we all need spirit baptism. Pray for it. Ask the Lord to fill your heart with his love. That's how we get the love. Love brings the fruits of the Spirit, right? So that's how we do that. Romans 5.5 5 says, The love of God is shed abroad brought in your hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to you. Love is the bottom of everything. It's the foundation for everything. And they heard the good news and power was given them to witness. You know, this experience is not unlike the experience that Jesus had. If we could turn to Luke, the fourth chapter, Luke chapter four, we're followers of Jesus, right? That's what disciples are. Notice how Jesus' experience was. Luke chapter four, Luke chapter four, verse one. And Jesus being full, full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness. And verse 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him throughout all the regions round about. Filled with the Spirit, and the fame of his message went everywhere. And uh, people were influenced by his ministry. So he began public ministry, and he says to us, So send I what? You. So send I you. What does all this mean to us? In this church, I see an army of people, young and old. There's enthusiasm here. I've never seen a church with the kind of enthusiasm we have in this church. We're in a missionary church here. And God wants to finish his work. And God wants a revival and reformation of primitive godliness in Adventist activity in which there is a zeal to witness. There was an excitement in early Adventism. You know, people, two or three families would quit their jobs. They would uh, sell their house or, and they would move to a community. They called them dark counties in those days. They would move to a place where the message of the three angels had not yet reached. And they would settle down 
and they would uh, find uh, some suitable way to, to um, support themselves. And in that new community, they began telling the message of the first angel. And when a group was ready for baptism, they'd call a pastor. He'd come and baptize them and organize a church. And then pastor would, the pastor would move on. <clears throat> the church grew rapidly in those early days of Adventism. You know, it's not doing that well today. Uh, in North America, the growth is very slow by contrast. But a change is coming. The greatest day for the church is still ahead of us. And now we need to develop our talents. You know, in the book Crash Christ Object Lessons, it talks in that, in that uh, commentary on the talents. It says the greatest thing we can do is develop our talents. Well, I thought the greatest duty would be to love our neighbor. But we can't really love our neighbor effectively unless we develop our talents, right? So <clears throat> this little Huachuca City Whetstone project, I'm not going to do all the teaching there. Others are going to, going to teach. I'll do some of them. But that's the perfect place. Maybe to start with, we might only have one or two people. What a place to learn to give a Bible study, right? In front of some of your, some of your peers here, your brothers and sisters. So uh, this is uh, something we're looking forward to. I believe the Lord will anoint this whole church with his spirit to witness in whatever way God wants to equip us. If we're not so equipped, we, we are a mission field ourselves, right? We don't want to be a mission field. We want to have a mission. And so uh, that's our challenge. Change needs to come. Revelation chapter 10, verse 11. Why does change need to come? Revelation chapter 10, verse 11. Revelation 10 is the, is the uh, prophecy about the rise of the Advent movement. I have to tell you, nobody talks about Revelation 10. A lot of people out there talking about Revelation today, but nobody talks about Revelation 10. How come? Nobody understands it. <laughs> it's about the rise of the Advent movement. And at the end of that passage, chapter 10, it says... And he said to me, you must prophesy. Uh, in my margin, it says speak. You must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. That's our commission. Nothing less than that. And it's the gospel to be taken to the world. The key is revival and reformation. Th these are the works of the Holy Spirit on willing hearts. What did I just say? Willing hearts. You know, we need to pray to the Lord that, that, that we be willing to be willing. That we be made willing to be willing, right? Willing hearts. The Holy Spirit empowers those who are willing to follow Jesus as Savior and Lord. Malachi 4 verse 5. You're all familiar with this one. This is our commission. This is our message. This is what we do. It's our job description. Uh, we have a message for the world that is... Not unlike the message that Elijah had on Mount Carmel. Malachi 4, 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Can you see yourself in that message? The last day Elijah message is intended to prepare the world for the second coming. God is Savior. So he should, so should we be. I, I'm sorry, I misread a word. Did you notice that I didn't say that right? Only God is Savior. <clears throat> God is serious, so should we be. Sometimes I can't read my own writing. The message is the message of three angels. Why hasn't the message yet gone out with power? It has been preached and taught for more than 150 years. Millions of dollars have been spent, and mission outposts have been seen all around the world. Why has Jesus not come? What should we be praying for in these days? 
I want to read a couple of statements from the Spirit of Prophecy. The first one is First Selected Messages 121. First Selected Messages 121. I see some of you writing these down. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all of our needs. To seek this should be our first work. Which work? Our first work. When we get up in the morning, give your heart to God in the morning. Make that your very first work. And then spend some time in the book learning to know Jesus for that purpose. Not to win an argument, but for the purpose of knowing him. To know him is to what? Love him. And if you love him, my, you'll do anything for him that he asks you to do. Another one from Second Selected Messages, page 57. The baptism of the Holy Ghost, as on the day of Pentecost, will lead to a revival of true religion and to the performance of many wonderful works. We haven't seen anything yet in the Adventist Church. Now, I've been in places where things were looking, were looking pretty, pretty promising, but uh, we haven't seen anything yet. And there's going to be a false revival really preceding the true one. And that false revival, we want to be very careful about it. What we need is a spiritual awakening. Luke 12, verse 49, in the, I don't have the NIV. Some of you might have that, uh, but I have it quoted here. Luke 12, 49, the NIV. It says, I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. That's how that reads. God wishes it were already kindled. I'm sure he does. Uh, maybe it could start here in Sierra Vista. What do you think? <laughs> There's a worldwide church out there. We have work everywhere in the world. Maybe that revival and reformation that would bring the latter rain, maybe that could start here in Sierra Vista. We're, we're, we're at the least of the churches in this conference, right? <laughs> we're out here in the, in the Netherlands. A revival, this is first selected message 121. A revival need be expected only in answer to prayer. What do you think we should be praying for in these days? Revival? What does that mean? It means to be made alive. Revival and reformation, what does that mean? A change. A change comes as a result of knowing Jesus. We need that every morning. Tomorrow I need to be in a little different situation than I was today. My life needs to be changed a little bit more tomorrow than it was today. The prayer of Daniel was, Wilt thou not revive us again? You remember that wonderful prayer there in Daniel chapter 9? He's pleading with God trying to understand the 2300-year prophecy. And he says in his prayer, Wilt thou not revive us again, that the people may rejoice in thee? That was his prayer. Ephesians chapter 6. This will be our last, maybe our last text, maybe not. Ephesians 6. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 13 to 18. My wife is back there laughing. Verse 13, <clears throat> Ephesians 6, verse 13. Wherefore, take to you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done to all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always and with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. 
Can you see it? Paul is there in that Philippian jail. And the guard is standing there. He has a spear in his hand. He has an armor on. He has a sword. He has a helmet guarding that brain of his. And you know what he says? Thinks, what he thinks? This is what I think he was thinking. My, Christians, Christians could do with that. They need what that, what that soldier has in the spiritual sense. And uh, the Holy Spirit and the Word work together. Uh, as we study our Bibles, we're using the sword of the Spirit and those kind of things. And the Holy Spirit and the Word work together. And when we give a Bible study, we can count on it. The Holy Spirit is there. And we go knocking on doors. We're told that angels attend us at the door when we knock on doors to carry the gospel to somebody else. Angels go with us. One of these days, I want to talk to my guardian angel. I have a few questions I'd like to ask him. So, uh, <clears throat> prayer and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, those three things go hand in hand. These are the principal weapons of our warfare. Spend time every day with the Word of God and in prayer. Closing text, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. I just love this passage. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through the word of God to the pulling down of strongholds. Whose strongholds are being pulled down? The devil. Samson's standing there at that great temple, and he has that pillar in his hand. And what does he do? He pulls on it, and the devil's things come tumbling down. It's just like Jesus on the cross. He pulls the principles, the pillars of Satan's kingdom to ground. We have that same ability only if we will believe. And uh, did I read verse 11? Or five, five, I'm sorry. And <coughs> let's see here, 10 verse 5. Casting down imaginations. You have imaginations sometimes? Does your mind get out of control sometimes? Cast those things down. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So many things come in the way of knowing God and bringing our thoughts into captivity. From Evangelism 341, this is the last quotation. Through much prayer, you must labor for souls. For this is the only method by which you can reach hearts. It is not your work, but the work of Christ, who is on your side, that will impress hearts. And in another place, angels attend disciples as they go on their mission for God. So it may, be, may it be with us. We need a renewed commitment to the mission that we have been given.